So, we were talking about birds, flying things, and I asked you folks to find or write four sentences. So I made it four up. One, one time I saw a raven steal hot dogs out of a car. It was a truck. I don't know how to say truck. We usually just say truck. Two, uh, can't remember what order I went in. We claim the kingfisher, our clan does, the shukach ati, and I'm happy when I see them. Uh, uh, there's a woodpecker called shaki khan, which is uh, red on top of the head. In English, it's called a yellow-bellied sapsucker, which always sounds like a, like an insult from like some old-timey cartoon or something. Uh, and I see them sometimes on our land in Skagway. And then one time I was talking with a speaker and he asked me if uh, I knew the word for penguin. And I said I didn't think there was one. Uh, there is a speaker in Juno who came up with uh, Gwengwen, which is really cute. And so is Hintak Yandakin Gah the duck that flies underwater. So that's the name that he came up with. So those were my four. Anybody got four to share? Okay, uh, I did four sentences. Two I found in the verb book and then two I had fun with. Okay, so Tauk it ich shuch ach yadaha uh, in the spring, the robins move in, come around. Okay. Tawak ki yik what the Canada goose lays eggs up the bay. And then this one, since it was ziusk, I just had fun with this one looking around. But ziusk link du suk shaka nuts ayak akadin. Great horn owl has earrings with the ears tied up. Like a male deer sprouting horns, it's the same shape. Just the shape. I just thought it was interesting with the use being off the ears for moose too. Okay. And uh, my mother is hungry for fried chicken. Okay, good as cheese. Okay, ha. Can I go next? As jokes. Kai ya waka shuk tesagena shuk a wa shuk. In short, tesagena shuk a wa shuk a dane askutu. I can't say the words right, but I did look it up. It's about the magpie. And he laughs in the woods when grandfather tells a story. And um, 
the sentence that I took the, out of a book, and I really like it. Hachaway, chuf da ye dot day. Ye teen on. This is why you see it even today by Thomas Young, page 170 of the uh, Healing Our Spirit. Hey, goodness, sheesh, Sani, you can't I'll go. Oh. Uh, these came, from, I think, were a combination, but from Kushiek's Forest Creatures. There's a song to it that I'd like to teach the kids, and I think these are um, phrases I hope that are helpful for them. Um, at yisa ach, listen. Ach, ach, I hear an eagle. Askatuk. Ye tchak, eagles live in the forest. Chat acha nuch tchak, eagles often eat fish. Etsk, yum. Okay, can you see scha? Okay. A two sets, set. Chat. Ah. 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 Dark a kadli yiji etsue. Which bird is that? Masa masa sa tua ach where it's in day lei. What sound does a canvas canvas back duck make? Gauch upwe iyan. Is that a ducky shot? Is it? It's guch sani at yicht paskin. Small birds are sitting in the tree. I have a lot more than four, but I'll just share those. Okay, come to cheese. Okay, ha. Zukke. Ha. Ah. Ya, ya, katank, dush ka, katuk, ich, kich, stin. This summer I saw cranes and hawk down south. At Haswadakin of Kwaslatin, I watched as they flew there. Gijuk Zantakahini Aya Tlalchwatin Nuch. I never see hawks in Juno. Ush Kwaslatin Tatke. I saw a crane yesterday. Okay, huh? Jeez. Must be heading south, those cranes. It's pretty soon. Okay. Oh. Um, these are all from Dictionary Clicking. Okay. okay. It's about a ah, not really about a bird. Um, Kijuk, it's ah, Kudziti. Hat Yisawe has a cow to nick ye, we paid levy, kakakayit. Raven talked to the seagull and loon out of the salmon. A cow, beech. Awe hasafigal kunach wekakid. The loons are really loud in Ankao Bay. Hin wan tut wugud we gusya dutli. The sandpiper is walking around the riverbank. Okay, okay, ben cheese, hasten. A do satsu? Ah. Um. Somebody, it sounds like somebody let go. Yeah. 
or maybe somebody. I guess it depends. Like, is it two words or one? Um, it, it just one. It's do not. I think the original it said. Do the, like the word I, I just swapped out what bird it was, but it said like that bird flew away from him. Oh, do not. It's two words, um, and so do is uh, there, like a singular they, and then nuk is to leave someone behind, or to leave something behind. So it's different than going away from it, because it's like I set something here, and then I walked away from it. Okay. And so it's used uh, sometimes like, um, like if, uh, if we were somewhere and I ran to use the bathroom, then I came out and every, the gang I was with had left, Next time I saw him, I might say, Why'd you leave me behind? And then, um, so that's, and it's also in the song, um, So it's at, it's at the end of that song, They all died off from it. So it could be used like that as well. But yeah, we would write it these days as two words. And uh, while we're waiting for the next set of sentences, these are wonderful. The next step is this evening on our class page, there will be a link to a Google Sheet, which if everything works right, you should be able to click on the link and enter your sentences into this spreadsheet. We will then look at them on Thursday and just examine and just see. Any questions about these? How are these working? Where'd you find them? What kinds of parts are we sort of curious about? Uh, just because it's, it's really fun to hear them, and it's also really fun to read them. Who's got some sentences? Yeah, okay. Okay. Oh. Reagan walked walking along the beach. The get the ya ya skin. The hummingbird is flying. Oh. I ha ha. The oyster catcher is eating. Gandada. Gandada. A star. A boot. The woodpecker pecks around the tree. Got the last one out of the dictionary. <laughs> okay. Gonna cheese. Who care? Uh, Ganda de Gugu. So its name comes from, it's always Gukin. Yeah. Hey. Uh, okay. Oh. Um, I took a combination of modifying from the dictionary and, and making up my own. Yukrat Shakaudligich, the cormorant stove. The auklet is looking for tiny fish. The loon cries like sadness. The J yells at me while I'm walking in the forest. Oh, okay. Katie, did I hear you try a couple of times? Yeah, sorry. My timing is always really off. <laughs> so um, I looked at the uh, workbook a lot. Um, and this one reminded me of uh, my mom. Athlun Kinda Chunate. And she is hunting mallard duck because my mom, we're okay. Sorry, this is a super short story, but like I just called my mom after class one day and um, I heard like wind and stuff in the background. And then she was like, Oh, yeah, how are you doing? And all of a sudden I heard this shotgun. She's like, Oh, I'm just getting some ducks right now, all sweet. And like, <laughs> <laughs> they cracked me up. Yeah, I loved it. But um and then ah kla tawak aha. My mother is eating like geese. <laughs> and um these other two 
I was looking, um, actually, like I have trouble with colors and numbers. So I was looking at colors and um, got Kheshehi Kaya Kaya Yi. Yeah, it's almost like a blue jay, and they're descri- describing like this pale blue. Oh. And um, yeah, and um, and Lao Ye Yati, it's like a baby seagull, and that one's um, kind of explaining this gray color. Uh. Yeah, I was actually really surprised with how many were like that. Super interesting to me. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah, the birds are colorful, so they give us a few colors in terms of like, I think Ak comes from a little bird, and Eishk is a bird, and Shawuch is a little baby seagull, it's all gray. Any more? Okay, uh, we will look at, there's probably one other resource I could put up there for you folks, which I will, uh, I'll share one of them now. These are really fun. Hold on, let me find it. I think it's this one. I believe there might be oops, a version of this online that has uh, it's read for you. So this is uh, I I have heard another word for Thanksgiving, which was uh, which is uh, pigging out day. So take your pick. I'll, uh, as we get closer to November, I'll make sure to share that with you. Or Hawkish Day, however you want to sort of look at it. Uh, let me make this bigger for the gang that's here. Uh, so this is a Tlingit coloring book. This is Natska Ish, Ted Valley Sr., uh, written by Gunak, Fred White, and illustrated by Yanastat Joseph James. Let's see, here is the story. I guess I got to make it a little smaller. So uh, let's try and interpret these. Natske ish aya. How do we interpret that? Natske ish aya. Okay, Natske ish is a name. I'll give you that. Uh, That's going to be a huge hint. That's all right. <laughs> I just said that's Gaish. He's the one. That's that's Gaish. This this is that's Gaish. So the aya and awe. Aya. This is awe. That is okay. That's Gaish. Do ish aya sta guan. This is that's Gaish's. Father Stavlan. Yeah, away. And that's, I don't know how many pages there are. It looks like 20 pages. So if you've answered once, just hold. But if we get this long silence, go ahead and go for it. Kindachunet. I'd write that as one word nowadays. Katawak awachun. Gunachisha ki hana at yes. Duck and goose. Uh, yep, duck and goose. What about our spoon? Yeah, he. In this case, they hunted it. There's our word for Thanksgiving. Let's give you that one. Hana atchayi yes. Dinner. What's the yes part? For the benefit of. What's that? For the benefit of. In order to yeah, benefit. for. Yeah, for the benefit of. So you say, Chana et Chayi yes. This is for dinner. Okay, just in terms of like how these little parts work the for part, and there's a bunch of these little things that we'll see. Oh, you see that? Oh, ah. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> oh, and it doesn't go anywhere. <laughs> That's okay. okay. Stock one. Nusk at kate du jeet ye a kausene. Three bullets? Three bullets. Du jeet ye a kausene. Gave? Yes. Jeet, like to give, to give? He yes. gave? So, and the stock one, do we remember what that was? Uh, the name of the father. Yeah, so this is Natsuki Isha's story. And then they said, this is Natsuki Isha's father. So if they start the sentence with stock one, that means he's doing the thing, probably. Unless the sentence gives us some major clue. So stock one, three bullets gave to him, right? So who did he give them to? What do you think? Each, right? And so think it does make you put a few of these things together, but it sort of assumes that you're going to get it. Like if we just say this is this is not each. Okay, it's got to be his story. So if someone else is doing something and giving it to someone, that other person is not each. Well, do jeet is to their possession, and then you have some kind of verb that comes after it, and there's about 16 different options. But yeakosane would be to give uh, several things to someone. Uh, is yeakosane one of the verbs that's by category? Yes. Part, part of it is by category. So there's a whole bunch of these verbs that we call carrying verbs. And it could be to pick it up, to put it down, to bring it somewhere, to hand it to someone, any of those. And then you're going to have to pick. You just, there's about 15 of them and probably about six of them that you're going to use a lot. Unless you're just working around rope all the time. Or if you're like a filmmaker and you're working with like coiled up or uncoiled wire, you would use those as well. So, uh, yeah, and we can look at some of those. Awati is probably the, the most common one, to just give someone something, a compact or abstract object. Like, Thank you for giving me the time. You know, gao, you could say, if it was a drum, I'd use a different verb for it. Look at some of those. Do ish ye a yausaka, there's a little part missing. Kesh at good kuch yit gudi. His father, the CH, I think, is doing something. Yeah, so the, the CH says they're the one who does it. Mm -hmm. But again, uh, we could get it from the picture. But in the context of the story, if we need to say, we would expect Natsuki Ish to maybe be doing something by now. So then the storyteller would throw that CH on there to say, he also did this thing. Then we get the verb, ye a yausaka. Yes. So there's these two verbs, ye yawaka, ye a yausaka. Both of them are setting up a quotation. Because you can use a kawanik. That'd be like, told him that dinner's ready. Told him that he, uh, you go find a, uh, the geese over here. Told him about these people when they came to town, or something like that. But once you go, ye ya wa ka, that means said this thing. Ye a yausaka said this thing to that person. So it does both of those things with that classifier switch. So in this case, there's only two people in this story so far. So once we hear do ish, father did it, ye ayausaka said to Natsuki ish. Kesh at kut kuchidagudi. Pretty good. It's pretty good, but we would have kut instead of kuch. 
Anybody know what this kuch business is? Um, back? To, yeah, either backwards or to return. So if you say kuch yitaguti, I would probably say, or kuch yitagut, they came back. That's what I would think. But then you got this kesh at gut, which you might not have seen before. Kesh, look at that. Negative. Yeah, it's like not, right? What about at? A thing. A thing. And gut is interesting, right? This is one of the things in Tlingit where every now and then I think English has a thing where it's like you can be this thing or not this thing. And then Tlingit has a thing where it's like this thing or a different word. So does anybody know what these words do? Teen or een or tin? With. With, right? So teen or tin or een are with. They all do this, a very similar thing, uh, the same thing actually, but you don't say kesh du in or something, and, and you don't really say kesh a in, as far as I know. So you don't say like not with that person, you say gut, without. So I could say, to that cool place, why'd you go without me? Right? So in this case, when he says atqut, what he's saying is, don't come back with, without something. Gives, him, gives his son three bullets and says, essentially, we can sort of reinterpret that as, don't come back with nothing. Don't come back with nothing. There's a few complicated things in here. Cute little story with big words. Yeah. <laughs> but it's okay, it's okay. Anything anybody recognizes? Yeah. He's here. Into his ear. Yeah. He heard it. So the Dane is like goodly or well. So what that Dane does is a few different verb roots that it can attach to to turn it into an adverb. So yuck a has a verb root a, and if you put Dane on it, it changes to an I. Don't worry about that. It just happens. Kedain means to do something well, to do it carefully, to do a good job. So even though there's a few other things, it's reaching across those things to the verb, which is wudza'ach. Okay? Duguk yiknach. So duguk is his ears. Yiknach is into the ears. I think it's got all kinds of ways about going into and stuff like that. Yeah, yik is a shallow container, right? You can't pour very much stuff into an ear, so it's got to be shallow. Nach <laughs> is through. Wudza'ach is for something to echo or reverberate. So you could say, this really was echoing in his ears, which is, another, you know, how would, again, we would probably reinterpret that, right? Like he kept hearing this, like he really, or he really, like it's really interesting the way that Tlingit does stuff like this too. To talk about like, like would za'ach would be like literally if you if you were over in some big valley and you yelled and then you heard your voice back that would be kuch kuch would za'ach. And there there's a speaker in Sikha who was using this because he was he was getting excited about the number of people working in Shingit, and he said. <laughs> Our language is echoing back, and it was it was a really wonderful speech. But in this case, because he didn't want to mess up, that's probably, that's probably what it was, right? So he's like, oh boy, oh boy. So, 
is a place. That's another name. I'll give you the names. And Natsuki-ish is a name. I gave you like almost half of it. Uh, Nazca ish hunting walked, Ugu walked, yep. went towards, there's a walk. Uh, walked, and so there, but there are a few, it's interesting because I think there's a few nouns that come from verbs that you can just put wugut in front of, and it means, or behind, I don't know how you want to say it, to go do that thing, atlech wugut, when dancing. Went hunting. Went fishing. Went work. Went to work. But you don't usually you put a day on there when they go towards that thing. But it just means to go do the thing. So he went hunting. Yikde would be in this place called Kabukku, which if it's if you're Yik, I would expect it to be like some very like a valley or something. Very shallow. Yeah, so it's usually noun will good. But there's a certain set of nouns. We'll see them in the beginning Klingit workbook. But Achlech, Achlun, Astech, Yechene. Those ones all work very well. Ashka, Ashka will good. They went gambling. Kech at Kateh team. With one bullet, with one, you could say shukwa would be the first, but yeah, so with one bullet. So atkate is a bullet. Mm -hmm. okay. And so this is, again, we could pull patterns out of this. You could say with one, with one spoon, right? I don't know, they can dig out of a jail or something. What is teen again? Teen, I know you said this. With. With. And it can be 10. I don't really understand it, and it can be in. I think it's teen usually when it follows a vowel, and in often when it follows a consonant. That's just a theory. We don't need the period, and there's a couple spelling conventions I would sort of take a look at. They know how to speak Klingit, so it doesn't matter if it's got a couple of things that we would fix in the spell. Klingit is really great in this story. That is six. Six, right? You see the number right there. Kinde Chunit, but I think Klay Awajak is kill. Yeah, Awajak is kill. Kinda Chunit. Is a mallard duck. Mm. What about Kla? He did not kill verse six. Well, that would be Kla. So this word Kla, T L E. I just want you right now to watch out for it. It means then or at that time. But just look at how it gets used. So you said, so if, if the whole sentence is, because we see a comma back here, kek at kate team with one bullet, kle du shukinda chudne ke awajak. You gotta sort of the word order when you put it into English, you gotta move it around a little bit. I would say, then with one bullet, he killed six ducks. Ah. Is a uh, like just? Mm -hmm. Just one? Yep, with just one bullet. Uh oh. And we can mess with the word order if we want to. We say, with just one bullet, he then killed four geese. 
Okay. Do uh, we're gonna do a spelling adjustment on here? Do dich a shoutlehik. Okay, his backpack was full. It was very good. So we would say, do dich a shawahik. But if we switch it to a shawahik, it's full, but there's an important thing that happens. We would say, do dich a shawahik. There's no uh on the front. Do dich ka gwechli a shawlehik. So there's an a uh on the front. The classifier switches to L. There's an important reason why it does that. But look at the picture. Because that backpack's not just full. What's going on? Oh, to show that it's third. <laughs> Well, it is full. It is full. I'll give, it's, it's, I'm, saying not, I'm not saying it's not full. But why would the classifier switch and put an object on it? I guess it would, yeah. Is it they filled? What's that? Is it they filled? Yes. So it puts a subject in there. He filled his backpack. So you're going to see this with quite a few verbs. It could happen or someone could do it. So you have these two very closely related verbs. You could say, Chachawahik. I'm, I'm full because I eat food. I could say, Chachayitlehik. Wait, You guys filled me up with really good food. Right, so the, the L classifier, it's switching from zero, in this case to L, to say someone's doing the thing. Shawahik, a shawlehik. Kune, so uh. you know I struggle with the S and the L classifiers. So what what would it be the difference if you said a shaw sahik? Like isn't that they like what what would be the difference between it if it was an S classifier? So the S classifier is usually the next one to put in there. But in this case, like if we just sort of take a look at, we'll look at the verb dictionary, and we're going to go find some, some hick verbs, see what happens. So we'll go to H, and when we go here, it starts with the E's, so he shouldn't be very far. So you really only get two options, shawahik, shawahik. One of the theories that Zeus James Crippen has, he says if there's some S sound in the verb, then it's going to want to use an L instead of the S. It most commonly would go to an S, but if there's some S sound in there and an SH sound is pretty close, then I might switch to an L. But there's also, sometimes it just goes that way. Like, yeah, another example, because I don't think it, um, a verb does not need to have all of the classifier groups. It just sort of switches over to one, right? So if you look at the a verb, we have yak a, kesh ush a, kik a. So you only have three options there. So it doesn't. There's no s version of that one as well. So it's just sort of like each verb has it. Each verb root. A, in this case, has its own set of classifiers. So once you have a root, you can now make verbs out of that root by changing the classifier group. So this, yuck A, is a different verb than shik A. Or you can add what we call um, a thematic prefix on that. If you put something on there, like here we have yuk eat, sik eat, ka. Once you put ka on there, now it becomes a different verb. So if you change any of those things, the classifier group, the thematic prefix, then it becomes a new verb. So 
and then I'll stop. It just means like certain verbs. Like, I mean, I get the zero classifier and I get the SH is more about negative things that happen. But the S and the L really depend on like that word, that, that verb just sort of tends toward that because they both mean somebody did something to it. And the L or the S is more about a category type. And then the L is more like it just makes that thing that you're talking about. It, it, uh, to have that thing. To have that thing. But, but sometimes the S and the L just do the same job, which is to say, somebody does this thing, okay. right? Like there's no verb to do it, but if there was a verb for make it rain, you would probably throw an S or L classifier in there. But it's already got wusatan, so I don't know. Okay. All right. So it's really a verb tends toward one or the other. Yeah. Okay. And, and there's, it's not a hard, there's no set of hard and fast rules. So I like to say they generally have these meanings associated with them. Okay. Does one, is, you, is it usually S? Like, I mean, if you had to go, like, if you were trying to create a sentence and somebody did something and you were making a guess, would you say that, that verbs tend to be more S related or more L related? There's probably more S classifiers than L classifiers. But when I learn how to use a verb, I look at the root, then I look at the classifier, and I just remember those two things combined create the, the meaning. Not so much like if you change this classifier, it will always do this one particular thing. It's more like just these combinations. And then you start throwing other things in front of it too. Good questions. Okay, anything else? What's gonna happen? Uh, we're gonna get rid of the K in there. Stuck out the T, ne stay with the ya. Stuck out the T. So I would. I would write sh as its own word. Tuqa with the underlined g as its own word. The w, uh, the u would go away. So I would say shtukaudati, or I might say shtukamditi if I was from Daislin. Nechte, nechteudiya, or nechtemdiya. Is Nechte go home? Go uh, home? Going home. Well, Nechte is towards home. Then we got this, what would be Wudi Ya verb. There's a place near where I'm from, where I was born, called De Ya. Day is a trail. Ya is to pack something on your back. So would the ya would be, or next day would the ya? How's that? In this case, next day would the ya. Ya is to pack on your back. Next day would the ya. Carrying the pack home. Yes. So ya would be packed at home on your on their back. If you carried it home in a backpack, that's ya. You said ya is just to carry on foot? Yeah, to carry it on your back. Carry on your back. And then what is adding the wood What? The is wait. Does ya mean something separate, like on its own, to pack on your back? Ya is a verb root that means to pack something on your back. Okay. Would the ya is to transport something by packing it on someone's back. What about shtukau, shtukau diti? Or shtukau wudditi? 
his reflection, so he carried it. It has to do with doing it himself. There's a separate verb there. Anybody hear this phrase? Uh, it's like, I'm pleased, or I am grateful. Oh, I am grateful. So, shtukawuditi. Shtukawuditi. I was grateful and packed at home. Hastukhunki. Put an underline on the first X. Hasawaig. If you change it to has to chun ki has au se i, it would be a really different sentence. We'll look at that. Uh, they, them, them, his friends, them, au se i, smelled. It would be has au se i, again, a very different sentence. So. We've cooked the friends, we've smelled the friends. Oh. Okay, it's okay. Five, maybe. <laughs> they're friends. But look at uh, look at the what's he doing in the drawing? Anybody know what kuik is? Mm -hmm. It comes from a verb. If I if I wanted to give you an invitation to the kuik or whatever, it would say, Iduwaik. You have been invited. So there's a verb in there, ig. Has to chunki, has awa ig. They invited their friends. Okay. It's okay, there's all kinds of verbs that we haven't seen yet. No friends were Yeah. <laughs> if you were to say to someone, kliat ke awa chunki, has chose i. It'd be called 911. <laughs> the other day I cooked my friends, right? But so, but these verbs happen, right? These verb slips. Ausi, awe'i. Atlein kun chisha ki ha na atchai hasawa ha. Another period that we probably don't need in there. It's okay. Day Thanksgiving or? Yeah, our claim is usually uh, many. I would usually interpret that as many. Or much. Depends how it's being used. But then, what is it manying? Gunachish yagi, chana atchai. That I would probably count as a single noun. Thank you for this day. Yeah, Thanksgiving dinner. And then there's different ways you could look at that, because Chana Atchai would be dinner. But if you were to say Atlein Chana Atchai Hasawacha, just take the Thanksgiving part out of it. If you said Atlein Chana Atchai Hasawacha. I wouldn't interpret that as they ate many dinners, but I would interpret that as they ate a whole bunch of dinner. Like whatever the dinner was, they had lots. Going back to thirds or whatever, right? The atlain modifies a noun. But the way it modifies that noun depends on the sentence. So we sort of as we learn more and more Shinget, we learn what it's doing. And sometimes our first thought might not be necessarily the correct one, because we might hear Atlein, and then in some cases it means big. Usually it means many. But it could mean big. I know, I was going to say Atlin, because <laughs> I was there this weekend Atlin. and looked it up, but it's a high tone. Atlein. Oh. <laughs> no way. Is, should be one word for dinner? Chana at chai. I would probably have that actually as probably two words, maybe three. 
Tutat this morning, Tutat et Chai, breakfast. Sitgav San, or Sitgam San, is noontime. Sitgam San et Chai, lunch. Chana is evening. Chana et Chai, dinner. Then you could have et Isani, snacks, all you want. Oh, let's see what else there might be. There it is. Okay, goodness, cheesh. Uh, I will put a link up to all these coloring books, and I'll say, "Ah, uh, clean goodness, cheesh." Uh, to Tzachek, who uh, had all of these, uh, the well, the Yakutat Tlingit tribe for making these, in the speakers that they worked with, and the illustrator that they worked with. Uh, but they made a whole series of these books, and they're really amazing. And then. Uh, a Tlingit language student, a man Fuller, had a whole stack of them. And I said, well, if you, if you let me borrow them, I'll scan them. And it took me a long time, so I'm very thankful she was patient, but uh, we have them scanned, so check them out. Any questions before we take our break? Okay, come back in 10. Do something different. All right. Anybody got any language questions before we're, we're going to go back to finishing the questions presentation? But before we do the questions, do you have any questions? Any questions? Like non, huh? I don't know, any, any non serious questions. Okay. So I'm thinking about how to say um, smoothie and think it, and I look the word for for like berry juice. Uh huh. But then I, I was kind of having fun with it, and I thought about that word you show us, um, food, whirlpool. Like, oh know, yeah. Food, food, whirlpool. That's right. Oh, that could be really fun. That sounds fun. Right? Okay. I think that's a great idea. So a uh, kep. Uchli would be a fruit or berry, uh, berry whirlpool. So the only types of fruits that are really here are berries. So kep just means berries, but it also now means fruit. So okay, sounds great. Anything else? So coming back to questions, uh, let's see. Oh wait, there's something in the chat. Oh, uh, crab apples are native to the area. Uh, this was in the chat. So there's a set of words, and shock. All those things were here. Kog was a crab apple. Kog was a hen grouse. Uh, shuk was those little wild strawberries. And kunz was the root at the bottom of a hemlock, a swamp hemlock or something like that. Oh, that one I'm curious about because at the time of contact, Klingit had potatoes through trade. However, the other one, kuch, we'll use kuch, we'll leave kunz off the list for now. So kuch is a plant called a chocolate lily, and it's also the little pouch of rice at the bottom of that plant. But these four words did something really interesting, and I don't know why. A lot of times what would happen is when we would have something, and then people would bring something that looked very similar, we would often call it like, well, sometimes it gets a new name, right? Like uh, una. So a lot of times they just make up a word for it, the thing that shoots. But when there are things that sort of arrive, like for example, kanashtsak, or kashtsak is a squirrel. It sure looks like a Tlingit word to me that's derived from a noun, or from a verb. 
But a flying squirrel is called katsak uwa, which means looks like a squirrel. So that suggests to me that that thing came somewhat later, because they had to invent a name for it. There's, some, there's a set of things for some reason. When kuch comes around, which is rice, the name for this flower is given to rice. And then the flower becomes Shingit Kuhu. The name for the hen grouse was given to a chicken, and now the grouse is called Shingit Kahi, which you could translate as a clinket chicken. What it was Kahk was the original word for that thing. Shuk is usually the kind you go by at the grocery store, the big old strawberries. Shingit Shuk doesn't get that relational marker, would be the little strawberries. They have one on there? Kog is now an apple that you could buy at the store. Klingit kogi is a crab apple. But it's original to this area. We know that because there's also, going on a couple of divergent paths here, two trees that I know of where the name for that tree is also the name for the thing it's made into, which is really interesting to me. Sucks is a U tree, Y-E-W, and also a bow for a set, like a bow and arrow. Kus is a crabapple tree, but is also the Tlingit word for a club. That's interesting stuff. I don't know. There's a lot of stuff you can sort of look at. Renee? Uh. With regard to the four foods, my guess would be that the the words were borrowed, the, the, the foods resemble things from the already had, but the things that were brought in were just so common and so readily available to everyone, whereas the things that they were named for were much scarcer yeah. and much less common. That the name, the name just st stuck, stuck without explanation on the things that were more common. And so then you had to go back and and have changed the name somehow to refer to, refer to the things that were less common. Makes a lot of sense because I mean, the rice one is kind of you got to kind of go look for that. The hen, hen grouse you don't see all over the place. Crab apples are pretty rare. You gotta go, you gotta know where they are. Hmm. The strawberries are kind of hard to find sometimes. I like that theory. It's a good one. Quine. Oh. This is a different topic. So I don't know if it it came up in school. I had a question about. So you were teaching the the uh in ye tune and talked a little bit about um what that looks like and harvesting and the cultural specialist shared that the women would traditionally pick the berries and men would um spear the fish. And I was just curious how that in my mind, like with the gender and going to they and like how how does the community, like, how should I go about that? Is that just, do, would we say that traditionally men and women would have these separate jobs and then, and, or, and do you ask the, the kids then to, only the girls would do berry picking and the, and the men fish or, I was just curious what the thought was on that. Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, I guess me personally, I tend to teach a little bit less on sort of like genders. Uh, but there are some things like historically, the Nahain was made by women. And for some teachers who would teach like Chilkat weaving, they wouldn't teach men how to do it. But that's going back two or three generations as well. Um, I think a lot of those roles came down to as well. Like, even though we talked to a lot of animals and we did a lot of preventative stuff, I think generally 
the males were going out and doing things that you're more likely to get killed doing because if the women die, then the clan loses like a whole lineage. And so uh, I kind of think of it, uh, I was on the health board for a search, I was on the search board when they came up with this idea called the Wise Woman Program, which was a really great program. It sort of looked at women who are over 40 and really encouraging them to be active and to get health screenings and a whole bunch of really positive things. And uh, Leonard Cato was one of my mentors on the board and he always would make this really compelling argument that I think he would unfortunately kill with his own sense of humor because he was a funny person. So he would say, well, there, th this is a wonderful program. We need more programs like this. And we also need something for the men because uh, he was stating a lot of indigenous men don't take care of themselves and their health, especially as they get older. They need to be having health screenings for things and they need to be doing a lot of things, take care of themselves and being encouraged to be active. But then he would always call it the wise guys program or he'd say, don't just shoot the bucks, you know, and so and they would all laugh and kind of forget the idea. I thought it was a wonderful idea, though. But I, I do think historically there were a number of things and there, there are some things related to this, which is uh, who speaks for the clan, who gives the speech, who gives the response, who says something when someone mentions the clan. These are things that are up to the clans. So the clan themselves determine who speaks for them. And I've seen female people speak for clans. I've seen males speak for clans. Uh, and I've seen both sides do great jobs and sometimes not so great jobs. And when it comes to berry picking, uh, the TCLL program I think is doing a great job as everybody goes. And then uh, when we have bring a seal into the language nest or a deer, everybody looks at it and everybody cuts it up and everybody does stuff. But we can talk about the way things were the way things are, and then also the way things are becoming. And th those are conversations that are at times challenging. Um, because some people will say you're changing the culture, but I'll say, well, every culture in the world changes. And for most of them, if you go back, it's getting more oppressive towards a lot of different people. And so as we sort of look at that as well, I think every culture can look at itself and say, okay, what are we doing and, and what should we do? But there's quite a few of those things, like there should still be a na tla and a hits a te, and, but it's up to the clan to figure out what those things are. Because we're at a point now, too, where not every clan has a speaker, as far as someone who can speak Tlingit. So now we got a whole other realm to deal with. And so, good question. Uh, I don't know the answer, but those are my thoughts. Anybody else? Back to the language, back to, and yeah, we can talk about the culture. It's very important. Uh, okay. So a content-driven question is not a. You can do a yes or no question, and you throw get in there. That's the starting point. It can get a little bit more complicated than that. Maybe yes, maybe no. I believe so. Stuff like that. But when you're asking any of these sort of the they call them the W or the H questions or the whatever, right? The who, what, when, where, why, like journalism 101 type of stuff. And Tlingit, these require two things. One is the question marker, which you see on the left side, which says what type of question you're asking. And then sa, which is a little particle that comes from a verb, which means to name something. Name it. Name it plus what? Name what? Name which, right? But the what part, it's not really as important to think of what that thing does, as opposed to when you put these two things together. It's most often a question, but sometimes is also a statement. So if you asked wa sa, that's most often asking a how question. But there are times you can say wa sa wuk e o e we That night was so wonderful. 
but it's phrased almost like a question in terms of the order of the words you're putting together. So this chart shows you what type of question you would be asking. It's very common for them to have weh on there, just because it sounds better sometimes with the weh at the end. Ya is right here, he is here, weh is there, you way over there. So if you say dasa, that's a what question. Something about the da. You see in the parentheses there's the letter T. If you put anything in between the da and the sa, that T should pop up. What could you put in there? There's this phrase ya nach, which means more than. Dot ya nach sawe chatutletzin hayu chatangi. What more say valued our language? Which is a riddle in Tlingit. What is more valuable than our language? The answer is nothing. Nothing. Daq asa is a which question. Which one of these things? Which one of those things? <clears throat> I was just talking with someone today about this ah. There is a pronoun that Tlingit has that we call partitive, and it means one of them or some of them. That's what's going on here. Which one, or ones, it could be plural, say which ones. That ah can be substituted. So if I had these two apples, and you said, I want an apple. I hold it. Maybe there's a red one and a green one. Which apple do you want? Wasa okay. or masa is quite often a how question, but there's a couple of them that sure sound like what questions, but that's just how thing it works. Wasa itu wasa. I translate that in the workbook as, how do people call you? And some people get upset by that, because they're saying, it means, what is your name? I'm saying, yeah, you're going to usually respond with your name. But if you look at how the grammar is working, there's a duh in there. Because someone, be like, people call me a name. Adusa or asa is a who question. Gu is a little bit different than the others because it usually likes to have a suffix on there somewhere. Gutsa, arriving where. Gudesa, going towards where. Gudaksa, going from where. Gunaksa, going through where. Guksa, resting where. Gusu, is or at where. Unsa, how many? This is another one where the noun can go in between the khun and the sa. Khun da na soe to asaku. How much money you want? Khun ka soe e jiwu. How many apples you got? Yeah. Uh, do you know what guh sa yande a ya guh sa at means? Because that's just in my head when you said the guh, and I, I'm not sure what it means. Say it one more time. Guh sa yande a ya guh sa at. Where yande? I'm not sure what it means, but it just popped into my head. Okay. I'll have to look at that one. Okay. I'll write it down. I'll go see where I can I think it's guh sa yande aya guh sa a a a. Yeah, that's good. So this would be where at? Maybe where are you going? No, because that would be guh de sa yande. Okay, let's go find the, and we'll find the guh sa a. 
It might not be a going. I listen to lots of recordings and I don't understand what a lot of them mean, but some of them, I guess, stick. <laughs> oh, yeah? Yeah. It's probably not a moving verb necessarily, but we'll see. Okay, so we're going to go up to the ought verb roots. Thunder is like over there too, right? I think it would be, I think it would be this one. So I think, where are they going to put it down at? Oh. That's what it sounds like to me. Cool. And so when, when, so when you look that up, so coming back to the classifier and the other things, so if you see a verb and it's which uh, I wrote down, but maybe... Um, so guksa is a where at. This X right here has to do with starts with an R, residing or resting at a place. Yeah, the, and that's usually like where are you staying, right? And then there's another way you could say where do you own land, but yeah, if you just say I live in Juno, I stay in Juno. Juno Kechetiti, it's that same one. It is also a time marker. So you could say Kutan in the summertime. Uh, and then maybe you could have like, it's fur is brown. But then you have Yende here, which could mean to the shore. But I think because we have Guksa in front of it, we shouldn't have another direction. Like this should be the main direction. That's phrasing the question. But we talked about these carrying verbs. There was that one, ye uh, uh, So you could have, if you put yun in front of it, that means to put it down. Ye Raven put his eyes onto a rock. So what the yun will become yunde if the verb is in the future. But when I looked at that, I saw Aya Gukhsha'at, and I thought that's probably not the walking verb because it has a and ya in front of it. But yeah, there's a couple things as far as verb sleuthing. If it has a and gukhsha, then it probably has both a subject and an object. So someone's doing something, something. Okay. Good question. Okay. What ginsa or good ginsa if you're from Yakutat? When in the future? Gwatksa or gutksa if you're from Yakutat? When in the past? Yes. For the benefit of what? Dat qasa or dat kaksa. I think dat qasa would be more common. Going after what? So those ones are a little bit different. When would I use dat yisa? If we were roommates and I came home, you're cooking this gigantic thing of stew. Dat yisa yisa eat. What are you cooking that for? Because I'm assuming, like, there's some big party or something we're going to. You go in the store? What are you going after? What are you going to go get? Then, which is a why question. Okay. So we looked at a few of these in action. Just kind of going through, seeing what happens. Looking at the verbs as well in these questions. I think we left off a duchsawucha who ate it. So keeping our sort of pattern going, 
what kind of question is Gu De Sa going to be asking? It's a where, but then there's a second part of the where. To where? So in this case, now the main question we got there is Gu De Sa Ya Ne where are you driving to, or where are you boating to? Right? Kuch is going by boat or car. Uh, here we have the verb, the whole thing is a verb phrase, like good day sa ya ne kuch. The verb itself is ya ne kuch. So there's, you could say, neishte ya ne kuch, neishtach ya ne kuch. So I could change those things right in the front. You're still going right now in a boat or a car, but then I could talk about like the where to, where from. In this case, you're asking someone, where are you going? In a boat or a car. The same pattern could apply. Where are you walking to? Where are you traveling to? Where are you running to? Once we start learning some of these verbs, we can substitute them into some of these patterns. What are you doing? Okay. What kind of question is Kun Sa asking? Time or amount of some sort? Amount. Okay. How many? How much? Kunsa. Okay, everybody says this. Kunsa iya u. Kunsa iya u. Kunsa iya u. Kunsa iya u. See how it stays flat at the end? Iya u. How many did you buy? What if I want to say, how many apples did you buy? What do you think? Kunsa iya u. Say again? Just switch the kun and the ka. Kun ka sa iya u. Kun ka sa iya u. Hey, how would I say, how many pencils did you buy? Kun kuhida ka sa iya u. Kun kuhida sa iya u. Let's see. What else can we buy? Say uh, again? Uh, cups, uh, oh, yeah. How many cups did you buy? Hey. <clears throat> What about what kind of question? When future? When future. That means the future verb must be on there. So if you're going to ask what kinsa, the verb has to be put into the future mode. So this yani gut changes to kaki gut. That's the future form for you are going to walk or go. Everybody. All future verbs, the stem, so when we say the root, we're talking about G-O-O-T, which means to go. When I say root, I'm talking about the meaning of that verb root. When I say stem, I am talking about the vowels 
are, is the, or the vowel. Is the vowel going to be short and high, long and low, or long and high? Because those are your three options. The future should always be long and high. All of them. They will always be long and high. Except there are a few verbs that never change. Like the verb ichsechan. How do I translate that? Ichsechan. I love you. That chan verb root will always be short and high. It'll never change. Most of the verb roots, though, they change in predictable ways. So if we went back to, whoa, it's back too far. Way too far. So here we've got gudesa yanigut, short and high. Must be short and high in this verb mode to be happening right now. But if it's going into the future, gakigut has to be. So the Gwatkinsa is saying, when in the future, nechte gakigut, when are you going home? I'd say, gushukka. That could be a good answer. Nine o'clock. Right? So you don't. As we sort of start to transition from, I think a lot of beginning Klingit, you say whole sentence question, whole sentence answer. But it doesn't always have to be that way. Because right? if you can speak a language, and someone says, what time are you going to go home? You don't say, I'm going to go home at 9 o'clock. Like, you don't always talk like that. 9 o'clock. To start thinking about these future verbs, Well, let me put, uh, well, there's a couple of options. We'll just stick with these for now. You see that? Goot, long and high on that. Goot, goot, goot. But the first one, kukwa. Kukwa. K underline K W A. I am going to. That's very consistent. Gaki. Gaki. You are going to. Kukwa. Kukwa. They are going to. So, what was the verb root for going by a car? Uh, right? So, if we change gut. To kuch, what do you think you would say for I am going to drive? I'm going to go by car. You're going to go by car. They are going to go by car. Totally different verb. Chut. Oh. Add something. Okay. But okay, I got to do this one a little bit different. Okay. So I'm going to say adds it or chop it. Um, I don't know. Okay, so what we're going to do, it's a little bit of a substitution drill here. The root is going to be chut. Okay. But this has an it on there. So there's one thing that's going to change. Is we're going to put the letter A in front of that. That one's going to change. So how am I going to say, I am going to add it? Kakwachut. 
You are going to add it. They are going to add it. I have that letter A right on the front. Oh, yeah, so as we start to think about verbs, it's a lot of pattern building. But once you know those patterns, sometimes you're just switching the stem. I could, we could use 20 different verbs just using this whole pattern right here and learn how to say them. Part of it is sort of just memorizing that. Okay, kukwa is I'm going to, gaki, you're going to, akwa uh, or kukwa, depends if there's an object there, they're going to. The next step after that is to learn how to build those patterns yourself. Oh, nay. Oh. Is there a difference between they, like, I will go and I'm going to go, or are those just two different ways to translate? Yeah, those, those would be okay. saying the same thing. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Who, oh. um, So that the K, underlying K, you're actually giving, I was thinking that when you that the K, so it's like a K, you say like a A, uh, like K, and then underline K. Because I was thinking you, sometimes I heard that that K would be connected to the vowel before it, and then you would just, you wouldn't make it a separate syllable. Does that make sense, what I'm saying? Well, so you could say K, so K. It's actually going, there's a little bit maybe of a U in there, but it's kukwa, or you could say kukwa. There's two different ways you can say that one, kukwa or kukwa. But to just sort of make it into as few letters as possible, I think we've gone K underline K. It's probably, because maybe some people are saying kukwa gut, but I think there's actually a vocal right in between those two. Oh. Uh, similar, you could say guggy, or you could say kaki. Those are two different ways. My experience has been test and speakers will always prefer guggy as opposed to kaki, unless there's a vowel right before it. Okay. Okay. So, when you're going to go home, but there's duh. What if I said, when you're going to leave home, little birdie? What would I want to change there? Day becomes duck. Day becomes duck. When are you going to get out of the house? Like, I don't know what the context would be, but it's it. What kind of question is Gwetk sa? When past. When in the past, oops. So when in the past, now your verb must be in what we call the perfective. The perfective does not mean past tense, but it means let's look at this verb in terms of whether or not it has happened. Yes or no. So in this case, everybody repeat after me. What does the stem look like? What is the stem? Short and high. Short and high. When I say stem, I am only talking about the vowel in the verb root. The verb root is gut, but you're going to have gut, gut, gut. Gut, gut, gut. Those are your three options. 
There's the classifier, ya. Okay? Iya gut. You arrived. Okay? Any questions? Is this like the future tense where the future tense, tense is always long and high? Is the perfective usually or mostly short and high? Great question. So the stem variation for perfective depends on a couple of different things. Number one, is the verb root open or closed? And what do you think that means? Open or closed? If it ends with a vowel or it's open, if it ends with a consonant, it's closed? Yes. If it ends with a vowel, it is open. If it ends with a consonant, it is closed. Is gut open or closed? Closed? It is closed. To think about, like, uh, the Hawaiian language does not allow closed words. If your name is Bill, you're going to be Pila. Because there's no, there's no B in Hawaiian, and it can't end with ul. They're not going to allow it. The language says no. Put a vowel on the end. Saying it doesn't care. Open, close, do what you want. But it does affect what happens next. We'll learn about the perfective verb, how to put it together. If you want to know the rule for the stem, here it is. Every verb belongs to one of four conjugation classes or conjugation types. When you look up a verb, it's going to say zero motion verb. That tells you it's a zero verb. You also have na, ga, and ka. Every verb has one of those. You have to know that in order to really be able to use that verb. For example, all zero verbs that are closed, the perfective must be short and high. That's why you have good. All non-zeros, na, ga, and ka, should be long and low. For the opens, all zeros are long and high. Everything else is long and low. If that doesn't make any sense, it's okay. We are going to be looking at this stuff. There's quite a bit of stuff to know about a thing at verb in order to really use that verb. When I mean use it, I mean you don't have to look anything up. You're going to get to that point where you'll look up that verb once, and then you should have it. Maybe you got to look twice. But there's certain things you're going to look for. You say, okay, i got to know... What's the root? I got to know the conjugation type. Then I got to know the classifier. Once you got those, you can you could do an awful lot with it once you learn how to do the things. But the things are like, what kinds of things do you need to build the prefix? What should the stem be? Those are the two main things that you do with a verb. Okay. And we're going to build towards all this stuff. That's the whole goal. It's like to just keep building towards this stuff. Listen to stuff, speak the language, read stuff. Oh, I said we're going to do kuk, and we didn't do it. I'm a liar! I lied again. Well, let's see. I think for Thursday, to get us out of some of the because sometimes you really get in the weeds with some of the grammar. I think the grammar is important, but there's always a danger that you just get fascinated with how everything works. And I think for some people it does really help, but for others, like, what, the classifier, the stem, the roots, can I just speak Klingit already? So here's what I propose. For Thursday, you start the class by listening to this wonderful pair of stories. There's you two different stories, and we'll talk about that. So we'll listen to it. I'll put on the screen uh, the words. You can read them in Tlingit, read them in English. Then we'll talk about it. Go back through. We're all going to take a turn reading a sentence. There'll be enough for all of us. And then we'll go back through and just sort of look at Shah Dog. 
Robert Zubrock, the words that he left us, which are wonderful. Then, I uh, look at the link tonight or tomorrow. I'll put it on ClinkitLanguage.com under Learning Clinkit, Intermediate Clinkit. There's going to be a thing to put your four sentences into a spreadsheet just so we can look at them. Because when we hear them, I think it's wonderful, but it might go by pretty fast. Some of us have masks, some of us are maybe far from the microphone. So it'll be good for us to look at those again. Then we'll move back into the asking questions things, and then we'll move on. We'll just look at reviewing a bunch of nouns, continuing to think about some of the stuff that we've learned in beginning Klingit, and we'll look at second edition of the beginning Klingit workbook. Sound okay? Kune? Um. I was wondering, I love when you speak Klingit at the beginning of class, and I don't know if it would be helpful for others, but as a reviewing the chapters, I'm wondering if like it would, I know it would be helpful for me if you said, okay, chapter one and two, go over all of that. And then when we see you next, you would speak in Klingit, but include a lot of the phrases or the questions or the words from those chapters just to kind of go, oh yeah, I get it, I know it, you know, and just kind of have a reinforcement of what we do know, what we don't know. Because <laughs> um, I realize I'll hear a word when you say it, I was like, oh, okay, I remember, but it's gone. But if I know, okay, Rene is going to be talking about something related to those words in chapter one, then I could like really go over that and then feel that success of you speaking in Klingit using them. I don't know if you've ever done that or if that would be helpful to anyone else, but I was just curious as we go over these chapters if that's a possibility. Yeah, that's a great idea. Um, let me pull up my, my Zoom thing. Go. Oh, there it is. Okay. Uh, yeah, so check out the link to the beginning Klingit workbook. Looks like the table of contents disappeared, so maybe wait till tomorrow. But if you just go to our class website when it says beginning Klingit workbook, like that just links to a PDF and a Google document and a Google Drive. So click on that and make sure you've reviewed probably up through chapter three. So chapter three talks about like introducing ourselves and stuff like that. And what I'll do is before we before we listen to a uh, I'll talk about myself a little bit and our people, and I'll talk about the uh, just in terms of like, as if Shah Dog were here, how would I introduce him and talk about him? Because a lot of that stuff will be in that chapter. But then if you have any questions, any, anything leading up to there, make sure that you uh, bring them. And we'll just sort of start scrolling through the beginning of Klingit workbook, saying this what this chapter is, what it's doing, this, this chapter what it's doing, this, this chapter what it's doing. Okay. Can I please? Hey. Oh. Um, just before we end, um, so me and Andreas are doing a Klingit hike on Saturday. If you want to let the advanced class know, oh, you can. or send like an email to like introduce us all, because the more the merrier. Yeah, if any of you guys want to come. Awesome. It's going to be like start off being easy. It's not in great shape right now. So. <laughs> <laughs> also, also be thinking hard. Yeah. They think it leisurely walk. <laughs> Everyone's welcome, though. What time and where? Um, so we can start like an email chain and see what's good. I'm really good with any time on Saturday. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So what I could do as well. On Thursday, before we hit record, we'll look at Basecamp and see if that's something we all want to start using a little bit more. I can't put the link to Basecamp on the class blog because it might get bombed by robots. But I can, I'm happy to share it with you folks and just, because um, then you can, if you sign into that, then there's a message board and it's real easy to sort of stay in touch with each other. And I'll look at ways to sort of merge the groups so that sometimes you can 
talk to the advanced group. And so I know in the in the post post COVID world, because someone told me we're in the post COVID world. I was like, yeah, sure. <laughs> in the post post COVID world, um, we'll probably have like one of the first classes of the month, and we might still try to do it in October. Is we'll just bring all the sections together to, mm -hmm. to say everybody's got to meet on Monday this week, and then everybody goes, and then we'll take Tuesday off or something. So. Yeah, because beginners can get two, right? I know. Yeah, because then we'd have all the beginners, because there are right now probably I don't know, at least a hundred people signed up for Shinget right now, and so if you need to yeah, each other's faces. Yeah. I know the but, beginners are super active on Facebook right now. I get okay, cool. I don't. I haven't set up a base camp, or I don't know what that is. Well, so. I'm in base camp as a result of the spring workshop and the move. And I find base camp really incredibly irritating because it's a constant stream of emails. Anytime anyone goes on to the campfire or the base camp, you get an email. And then you get every day at 9 o'clock the the, in the morning, you get everything that's happened over the past 24 hours all over again. And a lot of the times so far, have you been following this? Some of the, a lot of the times so far, what the things that are emailed to me are someone makes a comment. And it's usually in English. But um, so I just find it incredibly spamsome and not very helpful. Um, okay. However, um, there might be some way to structure it where it'd be less so. I mean, I really like the idea of a language community where we can all keep in touch. But the other th complication for me is that this all comes to my university email. Oh. I also work for the university, mm -hmm. which means first thing in the morning when I go to work, there's 20, 20 emails from base camp for people from, I, don't, I can't tell the difference from the spring or the, the MOOC, who have said something. And so then I have to take all those emails and I have to forward them from my university email to my personal email to sort of get them out of the way so I can actually work. And then in the evening, there's those 20 emails on my personal email. And I have to go through and see if they're useful or interesting and what, or want to save them. And I've been saving almost all of them, but really, very, very few are something I'd ever go back to. And if someone just makes a comment about, some, about either connecting with someone or, hey, that's a great resource, but they're not providing the resource because they're responding to someone else's comment. It's just, it's just too much. Okay. Well, we'll start, we'll look on Thursday and we'll see what are some of the, because there's some folks in here who know a lot about it. And what are some of the settings I can adjust and what are some of the settings that the user might be able to adjust to make sure you're not getting bombarded. Because it could be useful if it was like, hey, I'm in the thing, anybody want to chat? But then um, I think if you have the app and stuff, it might work better. Okay. Good point. You can. Yeah, to, uh, or a good way to connect us if we wanted to go on hikes or go do some shingles. Yeah, because we could do that kind of just to say, or like anybody want to get together and study. I'm, I want to study, but I don't know what to do because, and then maybe it's because I know that uh, last year there's a pretty regular study group for intermediate shingles, mm -hmm. and I there is one for advanced. But then there could be, because we also have a separate Zoom link from the one that I do for this class, which is just for studying the language. Mm. So, it, because there are people in Juno who are studying, then there are people all over the place who are studying as well. So, a combination. And then we also have a whole room right upstairs that belongs to the language program. We haven't used it since COVID, uh, but we do have it. So, that's the other thing too, is scheduling activities in the room scheduling sort of uh, times to get together and then also getting out on the land and using the language it all sounds great and so we'll look at some of the ways that we can sort of increase communication and how we can sort of tweak the base camp so it, it suits our needs and we'll also look at the groups that are there and what do we do because when people were in an immediate can get and went to advanced i didn't remove them from intermediate so um, there's still some work to do <laughs> okay, anything else?
I know I interrupted someone. Yeah, yeah, just sorry, one last thing. Um, is there any resource, because I feel like kind of lost when you're going through the verb root and all of that kind of stuff, is there any resources that I could go through and like actually work on like a workbook where I can kind of do hands-on things? Because I'm kind of lost when you're talking about Yeah, this. the beginning thing at workbook, like um, ideally, most people, a lot of folks have had beginning thing before they came here the way that we teach it which is from this workbook, which starts to sort of say, let's look at object pronouns. Here's a whole bunch of them. And the second edition actually does a lot more with that. And here's subject pronouns. And it starts to slowly walk you through the verbs before it starts to move them into perfective and future. It really just focuses on the objects and subjects and the verbs themselves. Then like, here's a whole bunch of verbs with first, second, third, first, second, third. So it doesn't do plurals, just does singular. Then we move into how which sort of says, let's just look at how the whole language works and then build ourselves up to really focus on the verb. Okay. That's kind of the goal. Okay, cool. Yeah. And always ask questions because I jump all over the place because I just I think about this stuff all the time. If someone asks a question, I was like, yeah, let's do that thing. And then we go do that thing. But we do have a bit of a thing as well. like. We're kind of taking a walk, and sometimes we go climb a mountain, and then we come back. We're like, oh yeah, we were going over here, weren't we? So, turns out we were just going to the store. I'm just kidding. Okay, let's cheese. <laughs>